Jonah chapter 1. And um, it's written, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction, to get away from the Lord. Now he heard the word. He heard God say, get up. He got up. God says, go east to Nineveh. He decided to go west, Tarshish. And it's written here, he went down to the port at Joppa, of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. You see God's hand over the whole situation. Jonah wanted to go away from God, and God worked through the heathen on the ship to corner Jonah. But it still wasn't enough for Jonah to repent. So when they asked him, they said, Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. What a testimony. He said, I am a Hebrew. I worship the true God. So Jonah is saying, I know that this has happened with the counsel of the living God, and I know him. But here he is, not letting that sink into his own heart, that I need to change my direction. We can know God, and we can even testify, but if we don't follow God, it's going to be a disaster for us. Jonah had to be disciplined for that reason. And notice that the people in this story here on the ship, which represent the world, they were understanding when a storm comes in one's life, quite literally here in the ocean, they were very sure something has caused this to happen. We need to find out what it is. It's not just a natural disaster, but somebody has offended some God up there. People have that instinctively. But it's not until we turn to God and say, Lord, am I going through something that I could have actually caused this storm in my life? If that's so, then we can actually go to God and get that pardon and repent and God will change the whole life around. But sometimes we can be hard-headed. And when God says, go this way, we refuse and say, Lord, but I'll go this way. I can handle this, Lord. And then calamity happens. And it becomes a great tragedy. Jonah, fortunately, had the living God who was so merciful. Now, he had sent him on a mission. The mission was, I have people in Nineveh who they don't know me. They are full of sin. They're just sinning every day. And I'm about to meet judgment on them. But, I'm going to give them another chance. I want you to go and tell them that I love them. I'm going to spare them if they repent. A good message. But Jonah was so self-centered and so hard in his heart that he said, I don't want to do that. I don't like the Ninevites. These Assyrians are ruthless people. They went and they're barbaric and they're just our enemies. He said, I don't want to go. He went the other way. But God was teaching Jonah a lesson about God's mercy and his love. 
Jonah received God's love, but he didn't know how to give it to other people. Think about that. We love to say, Lord, I, I want your mercy. Lord, can you deliver me from this predicament? Can you help my family, Lord? In the moment we receive that mercy, when an opportunity arises by God's divine design, that here's your chance to show mercy that I showed you to somebody else. It's possible for a human being to begin to judge people and say, he doesn't deserve God's mercy. She doesn't deserve it. And try to play God. Jonah had to go through some severe discipline where he got into a place of despair and then he understood. God did not let me go in the blindness of my own sin. Let's continue reading. In verse 10, the sailors were terrified when they heard this for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Since you are the man, you know it, we know it, what can we do? Jonah says, throw me into the sea. Now this is humorous to me because he's so deluded because of his rebellion that he actually tells them why the storm happened, that he's the reason, and then just throw me over board. That really shows that the hardness of his heart went very, very deep. He even believed that it was better to die than to see his enemies come to the Lord. Isn't that horrific? Can a human heart become so calcified that vengeance is harbored inside? That you did this to me? Even though I know God is merciful, I really truly wish that God wouldn't show you mercy now. What a horrible state to be in. God diagnoses our hearts. It's good and nice to be with family, with friends, and to say, you know, I'd like my family to be happy. Who wouldn't want that? I want my friends to be happy. But my enemies, I want them to suffer. The Lord says, that's not what I've taught you. I showed you mercy when you were my enemy. And go do the same thing. God wants to use our lives to transform even our enemies' lives. Jonah was going to learn that the divine chastisement was to turn his heart, the rudder of his heart, back to sailing with God instead of opposite to God's Holy Spirit. So he says to them, throw me overboard, and I know it's going to stop. Everything played out exactly as Jonah said. He said, I'm the person. My God, the real God, the true and living God, he's the one who's causing all of this, and he can stop this, but you have to get rid of me. They didn't want to repent. They tried hard, explored all their options, and they just knew we couldn't take it anymore. And they threw him overboard. It says here, instead, the sailors rode even harder to get the ship to the land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Oh Lord, they pleaded. They're crying out to the living God now. Don't make us die for this man's sin. And don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh Lord, you have sent the storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once. You see God's hand in this? God showed very clearly to the people and to Jonah that I care about human lives. I care about people's comfort. I care when they're going through distress, even to the enemies who actually were enemies of his people Israel, Nineveh, the Assyrians. God reached out. He showed love. He showed mercy. But Jonah didn't get that message. And so God had to teach Jonah, if you're going to represent me in this world, Christian, if you're going to represent Jesus Christ in this world, you've got to be people who show mercy again, again, and again, and again. Amen? Forgive because God forgave you. How many times? 70 times 7. Unlimited number of times, God says, show the mercy I've shown you. 
Jonah was in the heart of the ocean now. God arranged a sea creature, maybe a whale, to come and swallow him up. As we follow the story here, it says the sailors, awestruck by the Lord's great power, offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. So they actually had an encounter with God even through Jonah's disobedience. It doesn't justify what Jonah did. But God cared for them and he accepted them. They knew this is the God of the sea and the land, the living God, the real God, and we better fear him. And they made a vow, oh Lord, we're going to serve you. What an effect God had on the people right there. Now the Lord had arranged a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. A lot of people have said, you know, the Bible can't be true. There's no fish that can swallow a man and keep him alive in his belly. The fact is, there are creatures such as the whale shark, about 40 feet long. Imagine that, 40 feet long. And uh, they don't bite, they just swallow. And they've actually found dogs and humans who have been swallowed by the whale shark two to six days later alive. They survived. So always remember, whatever limited knowledge we have, when we go to the Word of God, if a question comes from the enemy, a doubt, how could this be? How can a fish swallow and keep a man alive? We have creatures today that can do that. When we go to the Word of God, it's very important to say, Lord, whatever you've written, my little mind can't comprehend it all, but I know one thing, it's true. Amen? It's all true. What God says about the sea, what, what He says about man, my own heart, it's all true. He will give me the solution. God wanted to give Jonah the solution. It says now, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. When you're going through your affliction, it's when you're completely cornered and you're leveled when no human help can avail. Your own resources are depleted. You know you need a miracle from God. It's at that time when you cry out to God for dear life and you say, Lord God Almighty, I was all wrong. I thought I could wing this, Lord. I thought I can continue having you as my partner. But I, now I realize you've got to be my Lord. You've got to be my Savior. I need you. I need you. I need you, Lord. I'm done trying to fix my life. I know only you can fix it. Only you can make it whole. Jonah got to that point. After three days in the belly of that fish, he despaired for life so badly. The man who said, Lord, you said get up, so I got up. You say go east, I go west. So stubborn, like a lot of us were in our lives, and hopefully not anymore. Going opposite to God's commandment, and then reaping the consequences, a lot of misery, unnecessary burden. Now, Jonah says, my eyes are on you. Oh Lord, I want to do your will. I want to do your will for my life. Jonah had a calling on his life from the living God who made him, who called him. God has a call on your life. Every single person has the call of God who's born again. Every single person. It's up to us to say, Lord, I need to know what it is you want me to do with my life. It's not about going to school and going to work and getting some money and buying a house or whatever it is just to survive and, and to enjoy this world. It's about saying, Lord, what is your will for my life so I can bear fruit for your glory, that I can live for your praise? Jonah was in the heart of this fish, and he thought it was hell because it was dark. It was lonely. That's how hell is, dark and lonely. And he's crying out, and I can imagine he might have thought, I wonder if God will still show me mercy. I want to tell someone this morning, this afternoon, if you feel that you're beyond God's reach because of what you've done or what you have, how long you've done what you've done, God says, I still have mercy for you. I still have that plan. Even if it is just a few years left, you can fulfill my plan in your life. What a message from God. Through this book of Jonah, we see 
God's hand is not too short that it cannot save. In your life, in my life, we have a plan from God to do His will, His work. Notice Jonah said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look up once more. I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Going back where he cried out from verse 1, verse 2. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead and Lord you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord in my earnest prayer, went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifice to you with songs of praise. And I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. What a prayer. Not long, but had, had all the elements of what God was looking for. It wasn't Jonah saying, Lord, you knew all the things I did good before. Lord, you knew that they are scary, these Assyrians, and I can't go there and risk my life. No excuse. That's a very, very critical element when we go to God. When we go to God, we should bring no excuse except, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry for living life the way I chose to, not the way you wanted me to. To say, Lord, I was sitting on the throne of my heart. I'm stepping down as of right now. Hallelujah. You reign over my life. Jonah got to that point. Jonah cried out to God. Notice what God did. God didn't give him a lecture. He didn't say, now I'm going to make you suffer longer. God is such a generous God, so full of mercy. Immediately, he ordered the fish spit Jonah out into the beach, onto the beach. He rescued him. Jesus said later when referring to this story, three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the heart of that fish, in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. That's the sign I'm going to give you, Jesus said. You crucify me. You see me die. I'm not going to stay dead. I'm going to rise from the dead. Three days later, I'm going to come and speak to everybody. I'm going to show that I am the Lord of the resurrection and life. Jonah was a pre-type in his experience of what Jesus would do. But it's written, Jesus said this in Matthew and in Luke. What happened with Jonah was he repented. He went 180 degrees opposite to the way he ventured out away from God. Went back east, went to Syria, right to Nineveh, and just walked in and said, 40 days and God's going to destroy the whole place. That was enough for the king, the Assyrian king, enough for the people. Immediately the king said, we have to repent immediately, right now. He said that and he proclaimed the fast. He got sackcloth and ashes, that's what they used to show their contrition. And they fasted. The word just came. Jonah just thought, I can just maybe touch on this and it's not going to happen. So I did my job. I'm going to sit outside this city. This is what he did. And watch till God overthrows this place like Sodom and Gomorrah. I can't wait. You see a repentance that happened in the belly of that fish. But it was not thorough enough. It started. That's good. But it didn't continue. God have mercy. When we say, Lord, I realize my whole life is a mess. No matter what I try, there's no satisfaction. God, everything eludes me. Peace, joy, friendships, everything seems to be in shambles. Oh God, I feel lost. I've gone through so much tragedy. I don't know what to do. 
that's the starting point. To say, Lord, I'm looking up. My salvation is not in this life. Oh, God, thank you that I realized that. I'm looking up now. But as they look up, God gives a word. I want you to do this. I want you to cut off this tie. Separate from here. Leave that thing so you can follow me for my plan for your life. They say, it sounds wonderful, Lord. Take one step and then about face like Jonah. And then wonder, while well, I went to church, I read the Bible, I cried out to God, I did all the right prayers. Why am I still having problems like this? Why am I still lacking peace? That's because the repentance wasn't thorough. Jonah cried out to God for himself. But he still didn't cry out to God for other people. God's love and mercy changes us to the point where we no longer say, now I'm safe. Thank God Almighty, I'm free, I'm safe, I'm healed. I will dance, I will shout, I'll tell everybody about God. But when they need mercy from me, I'll think twice about it. God wants us to be thoroughly changed in our hearts. Jonah goes to the city. He gives the message. Let's read that right now. Then, he, then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. God of second chances, chapter 3. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message. What was the message? God loves you. Oh, Ninevites, Assyrians, God has a plan for your life. God wants to be with you when you go to the bars. He's such a friend. God loves you so much. He's not going to judge you. He loves you so much when you're smoking and drinking. God will be right there holding your lungs together. Is that the kind of God we serve? God is a God of second chances and third and fourth and fifth. He gives them many chances. But he does it to change our lives. If I'm not changed, I can't make it to be with him because I won't like it, first of all, because he's holy. God changes my life. says, separate yourself from the things that are burdening you. Things that promise to satisfy, but they're elusive. They're empty. Empty pleasures and, and rotting treasures in this world. Get the real treasure, which is in Jesus. The real treasure, eternal life. We embrace that. And we say, God, the message that I want to tell my people, my family, my friends, my relatives, even my enemies, God does love you. He loves you so much. He died on the cross for you. He died a lonely death on the cross because of my crimes and your crimes. That's right. He's reaching out to you right now. But what he says to you is, turn 180 degrees from the direction you're going away from God to God. When a person turns course like that, even a believer that is backslidden, God says, I will receive you freely. I will help you to fulfill my plan for your life. What a glorious God. It's not all lost. Those who think the devil has brought things into your mind, that it's over, my time is up, so many years have passed, I've expended all my energy on the wrong things and now God is mad at me, He's angry with me and he can't possibly love me. He won't want to even talk to me. The word of God comes to you. As the Lord reached out in mercy to Jonah, God says, I can put you back on track. Hallelujah. Do you want to get back on track? Do you want to get back on track to pursue me as the love of your life? God says, I can help you do that. He will give us grace. Wasted years. Wasted efforts and energies. Being with the wrong crowd. Trying to be happy in a large stadium where people are rooting for human beings that will perish instead of for the living God. Instead of being there and being happy that they're alive, they can enjoy, but their eyes are upon God. There's no double life in God's kingdom. There's no double life in God's kingdom. There's a single, pure Life, that's the way of the cross. Jonah thought he can live life where he has God for himself. God is my insurance agent. Anytime I need help, God is right there. But for God to change my heart, I don't think I want that. We need to know this clearly. If we don't take the whole gospel, we'll have no gospel at all. If we don't take God as the 
primary love of our life, we won't have him at all. There's no way. Because he is Almighty God. He's the only one who gave his life for us. So Jonah goes here and he says, Yes, Lord, I'm going to go. I'm, this time I'm going to obey you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord. We're in verse 3 of chapter 3. And he went to Nineveh. It's a long journey. Hundreds of miles. A city so large, it took three days to cross the city. To see it all, that is. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds. Imagine that uh, Hebrew just coming into the enemy territory. He just walked in. 40 days, you're all history. Just like that. They could have captured him, stoned him, but he knew God said to do it. So he had this relationship with God. But you know what? As long as I do God's will, I know I'm safe. He didn't have that fear. But he didn't have the love of God. He didn't understand the reason God told me to go and say this is because God is showing his love through me with the message of God to the people. And he shouted this. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh, Nineveh did they say, who is this Hebrew? You liar. You person that's trying to make us get afraid. Fear tactic. Deceiver. They didn't do any of that. And this is a barbaric people. The Syrians were ruthless. They would just flail their enemies. They would uh, do all kinds of things that are very horrible things. Very, very bad. But when they heard the word, notice what happened to these people, including the king, from the king on down. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. God is looking for just this. So many of us, we miss this. We think God wants me to serve him, to go and help somebody who's, who's in need, to go and uh, read the Bible more and pray more, go to church. All that is there, but the first thing is God says, separate yourself from this wicked generation. In Nineveh's case, the whole society was wicked. What they had to do is stay right where they were physically and push away their idols, turn to the living God. And they did just that right away. What a successful venture Jonah had. He didn't have to plead with them, get on his knees and say, let me tell you the history of Israel from Exodus and the bondage and how in the wilderness they suffered because they were so bad. My fathers, please don't. He just says, 40 days from now, all of you are going to perish. Immediately, the king woke up. The people woke up. They said, we have got to do something. I want to tell you today, when the Spirit of God gives conviction, when he convicts our hearts with anything that he sees needs to change, we need to come to a point of decision. It's got to be a decision. I can get convicted and feel that emotion that, oh, I, I know I'm not in the right place. I know I'm with the wrong people. I know I'm not doing what God wants me to do. I feel it. There's no mistake. I, you don't need to tell me twice. I feel the conviction. But it has to translate into a decision that I say I've got to do something about this. I've got to do something about this conviction. The people got convicted. Immediately, they made a decision in their hearts. And the king spread it all over. He says, we've got to repent fast, immediately. Because the judgment of God is loom looming over our heads. They made the decision, but you know what? There's another thing involved. We get convicted by God's word. God does an a, a x-ray of our lives. He does a total survey of our history. And he says, this is what you need to do. You have to repent. You feel the conviction. And you say, God says to leave. God says to leave what I'm doing. I think I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. Got convicted. Made the decision. One more thing is left. Action. I've got to act on my decision. It's not enough to say, 
I feel convicted. Some people have erroneous teaching. Saying that as long as you feel convicted, even if you're a believer, you know pornography is wrong. And every time you do that, no matter how little, no matter how much you flirt with the imagination, you know it's wrong. There are many leaders who do that to this day. Christian leaders, sad to say. An oxymoron of the highest degree. Total contradiction. But they feel, well, I have God's grace. And as long as I feel terrible after I watch that filth, and I have feelings for my wife, feelings for being pure, waiting for the right person, I'm okay. Let's worship again. The Spirit of God is grieved. He says it's not enough. Being convicted is not enough. If all Nineveh did was, the king cried his heart out, even put the sackcloth on, didn't repent, didn't fast and repent, they would have been destroyed. But they said, the conviction is so strong, the moment to make a decision, decision is right now. You know, somebody lives on the wrong side of town, so to speak, figuratively and literally, mingling with the wrong people. The Spirit of God convicts them, and, they, and then the Spirit of God says, this is not where you belong. You do not belong here. And that word comes so heavily in their conscience, and they feel it, and they might even share that with somebody else. But they never make a decision. And so they go deeper and deeper into that pit. You know, the way sin is, it's so deceptive and so dreadful. This force called sin. That if I don't nip it in the bud, so to speak, it will eventually become my master. That's the way it is. Many people have said, I just smoke one cigarette, try one joint, watch a little something that's not healthy for me, but it's just a little something. A little bit of excess sugar in my diet, a little bit of excess fat, and then the addiction happens. There are things in the mind, in the human persona, in our souls, that are just not able to handle the force of the enemy when he comes with sin. Only Jesus can help us. But when he steps in, when the Lord steps into our lives and he gives us power to say no, we have to decide to say no. Amen? Not just say, Lord, you're giving me the power. I can feel your presence all over. But I still have in the back of my mind, after church, I'm going to go and hang out. And I'm going to watch the filthy show that God says, don't watch. Already decided. This is what happens through people's minds. The Spirit of God diagnoses us where we are. I have so many problems that I have to hit the bottle, people say. I have God. I'm so glad I have God in my life. I love Him to death, but right now I, I need a drink because I have so much of a burden. What a dreadful way to live. Jesus says, you don't need that. I'm here for you. I can take the burden away if you trust me and don't do that thing. You have to come to a decision that I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. If God says something is wrong for me, right now, right here, I say that's off limits to me. I have to come to that decision. Otherwise, it's no use. When I make that decision and then pick that thing up and trash it, cut the avenues to get more of that stuff, that's what repentance is. That's when God knows you're serious. That's the only time God's mercy will come to transform your life. The gospel of God is not impotent. It is, Paul said, it's powerful to change hearts. It's the power of God unto what? Salvation, which means a total liberation from all of what people say, my demons. Even in Christianity, sad to say. People say, oh, he's a good man. She's a good person, but... They're dealing with their, their demons. It's an ownership. He has his demons and she has his, her demons and we all have our demons. Is that some great tragedy or what? That means Jesus is not there. Jesus will not be there when the devil is there. One stays and one goes. A Christian is called to a life of freedom. We have to say, Lord, whatever my experience was, whatever I've been taught, Whatever I've seen in other Christian leaders' lives or people's lives, 
I don't want to know anything. I want to know what you say. Your word is my rule and practice. That will change your life. When God says, I've made you a new creation, we have to say, yes, Lord, I'm a new creation because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No sin has any power over my life. No fear, no anxiety can rule my life. Jesus is in my heart. We have to believe. Step forward and say, I'm going to follow what God said. Get into the word of God. Say, Lord, my vocabulary is changing. I'm going to start speaking like you. Heaven's language of faith. I am free. Sin has no dominion over me. I'm living by grace, but a victorious life. Jonah didn't learn that he needed to surrender to God fully. But he wanted the security. But he went to Nineveh and said, your life's not right. God's judgment is coming. Instantly they repented. This is exactly why, listen to this, in the New Covenant, Jesus says, as he quotes this very passage, or this book, he says, like Nona, uh, Jonah, Nona, somebody's Nona here. Like Jonah, or Nona, you know, I don't know if somebody is called grandmother in, in a certain language, but listen to this. Your Nona, your grandmother, whoever you have, is speaking to you and saying, repent, don't do this. Jonah went and preached. Jesus said, the generation in Assyria, Nineveh who didn't know me at all, they are going to rise up and condemn this generation where I have spoken to you my message of salvation. Jesus said that. The Ninevites are going to rise up on judgment day, a whole bunch of them, including the king, and say, you people who heard Jesus' words, you didn't repent? What is wrong with you? All we had was a, a rebel prophet, and he came, he just dropped a bomb, and immediately we shuddered and repented. But Jesus comes with so much compassion, so much love. He says, turn to me. I love you. I died. I'm going to die on the cross for you. And people say, you know what? That's a very nice, it's a beautiful message. But today, right now, I'm headed to Starbucks right now. I need to unwind and I'll get to that later. Right now, there's a ball game going on. And I'm so fired up, I don't have time to think about salvation. I'm thinking about vengeance right now. I want the other team to lose. These are the kind of things that happen in people's minds. They're so preoccupied. The gospel of Jesus is the most important thing for us 24-7 for eternity. You say, Lord, you've called me to follow you. Who am I that you should call me King of kings and Lord of lords to follow you, to serve you, O oh God, to be used by you, Lord, to live a life that is so fulfilling and to change people's lives who are sinking in despair somewhere in a corner. They're dying, Lord, or in a crowd. They're still dying. And God can tap you like Jonah and you can go the right direction and say, what I need to do may be important, but not more important than God's work. Amen? I need to go and give the message of the gospel to this person. But I want to tell you, the message that came from Jonah, as well as the Lord Jesus, wasn't all love in a humanistic, where you are, he knows where you are, who you are, and in spite of what you are, he loves you. There's more to that. He says, because he loves you in spite of those things, he wants to change you. He wants to free you. What kind of salvation is salvation if it's going to keep me in chains and somebody loves me? That's not being free. God said, I love you enough to free you from your bondage. You have an addiction to something, I want to break that free. Are you afraid in your life? I want to free you from the anxiety. Are you afraid of the future? People are looking to politics and the climate and to economy and terrorism and, and so much fear and how am I going to raise my kid in this generation? So many believers have that question. It should never be a question because God is on the throne. If God is not on the throne, you can have fear. But if you love God and God gave you your child or your children, He will take care of them, provided you follow God and you teach them and train them in the ways of God. Amen? God will never go back on His word. His word will not come to His void. Jesus said... I love you, but it grieves me to see you sit there as a slave to your greed, to your selfishness, 
to your violence, your anger, your vengeance, your bitterness, your drugs, your addictions of all kinds. I came to set you free. Jonah just said, you're in trouble. The Ninevites immediately repented. And the king and all his leaders sent a decree. We're going to fast. Jonah says, my job is done. I'm going to go back. And what happens? He goes outside and he watches to see God's judgment come down. God is not a God who is a tyrant. He's not a God who is waiting for us to make a mistake and then punish us. He is God Almighty. He's not like a man. He's so full of love. Jesus says, no matter what you've done, no matter how long you have spurned my grace, this day the message is coming to you that I love you, I can change you. I still want you. Oh God, what a love. When human beings will say, I don't want you anymore. I don't like you anymore. God says, I want you and I love you. Not just like you, I, I love you, I want to change you. I want you to live with me, I want to live with you forever. That message involves, if you want to be with me, you've got to leave the world, leave the devil. Is that a fair thing to ask? Is it unfair, I should say? If God says, I have a mansion waiting for you, I have so much waiting for you, I have so many gifts of the Holy Spirit waiting for you. I have treasures that you can never ever get on this side of eternity. All for you. All I want you to do is leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Is it too hard to ask? Is it too hard to follow? Can I stay in my sin and have fellowship with God? That's impossible. So the message involves repentance. So I'm convicted by the message. And I say, oh Lord, I can identify right now, even as I hear this, there's some things in my life that have become idols in my life and I can't seem to part with it. And Lord, it, it really grieves me that I have to even think about parting with it. It's become such a part of me. But with the conviction from the Spirit of God and the time that you've given me, Lord, I'm making a decision today. I'm making a decision. I will part with it. Amen? We've got to go to that step. Not feel it and then say, I hope I get the feeling next week. You may not live until next week. That's the truth. When we feel convicted by the Spirit of God in anything, anything, we've got to say, I've got, I've got to make a decision. If you're sitting in a crowd and the Lord prompts you, get up and go share my love with that person. And you look around and you see strangers. You see that so many things tell you you can't do it. When you know that God said to do it, you feel that heavy conviction. You've got to get up making that decision, I'm going to go do what God said. If I don't have that act of the will that with God's part done, convicting me, I have to step up right now and say, Lord, what did you tell me to do, Lord? I made a decision. Here's my decision, Lord. I will follow what you say. As I say that in my heart and I say that to the Lord, I have to say now, I'm going to act on this thing. I'm going to step forward and follow through. Come back and say, Lord, I did what you told me to do. Then God will graduate you to the next level in his journey of faith. To strengthen you, to toughen you against the devil. Where the devil will not be able to toy with your heart with anxiety and fits of rage and immorality, in addiction to things that are destroying you, you'll really feel, you know what? Every time I obey the Lord, I'm getting stronger and stronger. And that's exactly how it works. When we obey the Lord in the little things, He makes us stronger for the bigger things. There's a, there's a progress there. It seems so simple and logical, but people are hounded by the devil. I can't do that little thing, Lord, because I feel so weak. I feel helpless. God said, that's why I'm there. When I give you the commandment, if you agree with what I say, you're going to get the grace to do what I say. Amen? That's how it works. The man with the withered hand could have said to the Lord, when the Lord said, stretch out that crippled hand. He could have said, oh Lord, I can't do this. I've been struggling with this for so long. The nerves are gone, oh God. There's no blood circulation, oh God. Give him all the medical diagnosis. God says, but I'm the great physician. I'm telling you to do this. That man didn't listen to his feelings. He didn't listen to the devil. 
Jesus said, stretch out your hand. He said, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. He just said, yes, Lord. You see, it wasn't, can I do it? Is it safe? Will I look like a fool? Jesus said to do this, I'm doing it. And he did it. Perfectly whole. Anything in our lives, whether you're an unbeliever or a Christian, when God says to do something, just do it. That didn't start with Nike. It started with God. Just do what God said. Jesus said, just obey me. Nobody can promise what God can promise. Because every time we obey the Lord, we step into a little more of his glory. Where now, your ears are open. Your eyes are open to heaven. God can communicate with you freely. All of a sudden, you can have a vision. Yes, a dream pinpointed from the Holy Spirit. Just in the nick of time to save somebody. To tell you to do something. But before that, totally oblivious to the things of heaven. Because you know why? I'm struggling to do the first thing God told me to do. When did he tell you to do it? 20 years ago. He told me to go and forgive that person. No. Anybody but him. Anybody but her. So what happens? They're crippled spiritually. And it is a shame to the name of God to say I'm a Christian and be crippled spiritually. To be in bondage. I should be able to say, the moment the Lord said to do something, there came a point in my life, oh, I was a disobedient person. The Lord did this for me. He rescued my life. But you know what? When he said this, I didn't like it. And so because I didn't like what he said for me to do, I delayed, I disobeyed, I walked away. But God was there with me. He's still with me today. But you know what? I can't really hear from God. It's guesswork. Instead, it should be, there came a point in my life that I made a decision with a conviction from the Holy Spirit. Jesus, from this point on, every single thing that you want me to do, I have decided to do it. Everything. Everything. No matter how counterintuitive it is, no matter how scary the devil says it is, if you want me to go into a city that is full of strangers and barbarians, Lord, you want me to preach like Jonah, I will do it in Jesus' name. Can we say that? Is God the God of your life or is he somebody who's there to just pull you out of your own hangovers, hang-ups, whatever is bothering you? Jesus is not just somebody who's there to come and make me feel better. He's there to change my life so I can live for his glory. So Jonah sits outside the city and he's watching. God spares the entire city. All of them, all of them lived. They were idolatrous, immoral, violent crimes happened there every day. Like one of our big cities today. God says, if you just listen and repent, I will spare you. And they got spared. Jonah still didn't get the concept of God's love. That he loves to the point of telling the truth about you, the truth about me. We can always go to a friend, a good friend, and say, what do you think about my hair? What do you think about my clothing? What do you think about my smile? My writing? You know, and they'll say, you're good. But to go to God and say, Lord, what do you say about my heart? Am I right with you, Lord, or not? That's all I want to know, Lord. God will say, I'll tell you exactly the truth so I can fix you. We have a choice to either listen to human beings, or even ourselves, or the devil, who will never tell us the whole truth. Never. Because only God knows the whole truth. God is willing to tell us the whole truth and nothing but the truth to change our lives, to make us live bold and free and full of love and real joy, to make a difference in this world save a whole bunch of people with us who would have gone to hell. Nineveh would have gone to hell. See the impact of obedience in the little things and in the big things. Jonah preached. He cried out to God when he was in the belly of that fish. God had mercy. He went and did what God said. He repented in that aspect. 
but he didn't repent in his heart to forgive the people. God says, I know they're wicked, but I can't stand to see them perish because I made them. I'm going to give them another chance. He preaches the message. Instantly they get sa saved, basically. And he's upset. And he says to God, God, didn't I tell you this is the reason why I didn't want to go? Because you're such a gracious, forgiving God. I can't stand what I'm seeing, Lord. The whole bunch of people repenting. I wish they would have been burned at the stake, God. What a horrible feeling he had. He was so bitter. Then he goes and he gets some shade by a tree, a plant. And he sits there because it's so blazing hot. And he's feeling comforted by that plant that grew up. God made it grow up right there. And he's oblivious to God's hand in all of this. He's just sitting there, probably mulling over, I can't believe they repented. Oh God, I wish I'd die. That's what he said. Just kill me. I'd rather die than to see my enemy made whole before God. You see the depth of human wickedness? Hatred is a terrible thing. Vengeance and bitterness harboring memories and, and playing it over and saying, I can't wait to meet this person. Or when they get sick, when they go through a hard time, I have an inward satisfaction. God have mercy. We need to crucify that. That's not from God. Rather, we should be praying for them. David did that. David said, well, my enemy was sick. My enemy was sick. I fasted and prayed for my enemy. Look at David. What a great, beautiful human being he was when he followed God. All of these things for us to read in the Word of God and say, God, my heart is not right. If I should die today, there are some people that I need to settle accounts with. I still haven't done it. I know I'm not making it to heaven. Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, my Father won't forgive you. So we come to God, and as Jonah was being taught this lesson, and he sat there outside the city, and he was full of anger, but comforted from the heat by this gird, this plant. God made a worm come and eat up that plant. Jonah got so angry that the tree just disappeared. He was burning. He was fuming. You know what God said? You care so much for this plant, which just propped up and is gone. Yet, you don't care about these human beings. 120,000 human beings who did what? wrong because they didn't know right from wrong. They didn't hear about me. All they knew were idols. The Assyrian idol this, idol that, and go and worship, offer sacrifice, pagan immoral things. You know, they just thought, you know what? This is what, who we are. When you live in the gutter, you're surrounded by gutter, God says, I'm going to show you there's a life beyond the gutter. That message gives me hope that God has a different life for me. And the gutter is not just simply a physical necessary a physical location but it's a spiritual condition of a life that is full of deceitfulness people lie like water like drinking water it's easy to lie a little lie, a big lie, white lie, purple lie is still a lie God says don't lie anymore don't lie anymore because that's not for me now you're with me don't hate anymore forgive be patient it's like I was with you. Be patient to other people. Watch your language. Don't curse anymore because that's not for me. You see how much we have need of God to change us? But I can just walk away and say, Lord, I know the gospel. I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can tell you all about Jonah. Isn't that amazing? But I still do what? Disobey God. God said, it's no use to know those stories if you don't change your life. God says, I can help you. He had such pity and mercy on these Assyrians. The moment they repented, you know, we have such a greater chance of living a fuller life for God today because we know Jesus' gospel. Right now, if you determine, Lord, from my language to my innermost attitudes to our people, Lord, to my Thoughts about success, what constitutes success. Lord, to my plans about my future, 
I'm surrendering everything to you as of this moment. Hallelujah. I thought I was a Christian, but I really see. I knew about you, but I didn't know you. Because if we know God, we'll be changed. That's the knowledge of God that God is looking to give. But my life has changed. So as we conclude today, we think about this, that Jonah followed through on doing things in a legalistic way. God said to do this, I'll do this much and no more. Even when I do something for God, my heart is not right, but as long as I do it, isn't that all that matters? God says, no, your heart matters too. Have the right attitude and motivation. If you help somebody, Paul says this, feel that love in your heart for that person. Let love be without pretense. If I say, God bless you, or if I say, here's something I want to do for you or give you, do it from the heart with the compassion of Jesus. When you show mercy, do it from the heart. When you show love, do it from the heart. If you speak about holiness, do it from the heart. Be holy yourself. God is raising up a remnant these days all over the world. And they're going to be a holy people. There's no other way. God is holy, and if we're going to be with Him, we have to be holy. We have to say, Lord, there are things in my life that I'm allowing that have got to go. I have to do some house cleaning within my heart, within my house, within my possessions. I need the Spirit of God to show me, like in Nineveh, where I need to repent. Remember this. Conviction is good, but not good enough. Conviction must lead to a decision of the will. God told me to do something. I know I'm not in the right place. There are relatives that I have harbored bitterness against for what they did to me or what I thought they did to me. And even if I see them at our gathering, I may smile, but I have vengeance in my heart. God says, shut that down and get it out before it kills you. I may feel that I'm not stealing anymore, but I'm still trying to take credit what belongs to other people to make it my own. God says, don't do that. God says, be humble, be gentle, be patient, forgiving, be holy. Where we need to cut the ties, we've got to cut the ties. Otherwise, we'll be lured back into the same, same vomit over and over again. God says, don't watch that TV because it has Satan's things just trying to mesmerize you and draw you into little by little defilement. Cut it out. Simple as that. God says, don't be with this crowd because they're going to make you feel you want to drink again. Don't go there. Don't be there. This is repentance. You get convicted by God. You have to do something about it. You have to say, I'm making a decision. I make a decision. Today, as I hear this message, I have to cut some ties. Yes, I do. Otherwise, I'm not making it to be with Jesus. He showed me all his love, but I have to follow through in obedience. Today, I'm going to throw some things out in my house because it's not pleasing to God. I'm not going to make it to heaven. If I should die, God forbid, if I should die in the hospital or on the street or on the job or at home during a recreation, if I'm not right with God, if I don't say, Lord, I have repented thoroughly in my heart, I'm not going to make it to heaven. We have to have that fear that Nineveh had. The king of Nineveh feared God. He said, when Jonah said this, he was not playing. It's going to happen in 40 days. Guaranteed. We have to move now. And they did. The entire place was spared. If God had so much mercy on them, how much more on you and on me? The moment you say, Lord, I thank you for what you started in my life. It's such a beautiful work. You are so beautiful, Lord. And I know I have a long way to go. But Lord, I'm, I'm in it for the journey. Lord, I'm going to take a baby step. Anytime you say to do this, no questions asked. God, all, all I want to know is, did God say to do it? I'm doing it. Amen? And God will put us on that pathway to such a tight relationship and walk with God. Unlike Jonah, when God taps you for something he wants you to do, you'll be able to know 100% this is God's will. And as you walk in God's will, knowing that confirmation from God that I'm pleasing my Father, your life will certainly be a shining testimony. Everywhere you go, they can't help but notice, this is the real Jesus. 
I see him in your life. And they'll feel convicted themselves. They'll say, what do I have to do? What decision do I have to make? You don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't curse, you don't cheat, you don't steal, you don't lie. Who are you? A real Christian. Hallelujah. A real authentic Christian who lay down my life so that others can live. What a beautiful life to live. Fulfilling life. God wants that for you. He wants that for me. If you haven't already made the decision, as you stand up, as we close, I want to give that opportunity as God put it in my heart. This morning, and those of you who are watching online, this message is not my message. It's a message from the Almighty God. Make your decision. If you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit that certain things need to change, you're not here to please the preacher. The preacher is not here to please you. We're here to please the living God because he's the one we have to go to. Some of us very soon will meet the living God. No turning back. We've got to be ready. We have to say, Lord, all the passing pleasures in this life, so much of my energy, so much of my time, my affection, it was all empty after all. It won't do any good on judgment day. Help me, Lord, to put first things first right today. I want Jesus to be my first love. He's the lover of my soul. Oh, I want to get to know you, Lord. I want to get to know you, Lord. I want to know you through your word, through what you've said about you and about my life, about salvation, what repentance is. I want you to think, if the Lord has convicted you of something very clearly, if you don't make a decision as you hear this message, you may not get another opportunity. God have mercy. I've seen this happen. You need to have the fear of God. There's such a thing as a good fear of God that will move you to make a decision. Say, Lord, my life is not right. I still have idols. Some people worship their vehicles. Some people their homes. Some people their relatives, their friends. Some people worship their, their bodies. So many idols, money. Traveling could be an idol because people feel, if I can't travel, I feel trapped. Some people, some women, some wives and some husbands, if they can't get out of their house every week, they feel like they're trapped and they're no good, they're bored. What happened to the altar? What happened to secret communion with God? What happened to say, Lord, if I can be with you, that's heaven to me, wherever it is. Whether I'm in the house or out of the house. Amen? Where Jesus is, that's where I want to be. Hallelujah. So many things that make people, their clocks tick, so to speak. If they can't have it, they feel like they don't have enjoyment or peace in life. We need to really understand the Spirit of God is diagnosing us this morning. What makes you tick? What really drives you to live every day? Some people say, you know what? Honestly, there's nothing that really drives me. I feel so alone. I feel hurt. I feel wounded. I feel betrayed. Just when I got to know somebody, I loved them, I lost them. Some people are burdened with such a heavy weight. It's not uncommon. God's saying today, turn your eyes upon me. I'm the friend that will never leave you. Oh, my Jesus. I'm the lover of your soul. I will take care of you. I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will comfort you. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. I will give you the victory. I will give you the healing you need. I will give you the comfort. Everything you need is found in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There are those who say, Lord, with everything that I've been wounded with and I've suffered, Lord, at the end of my life, or at least where I'm at this point, I'm seriously wondering why I'm alive. To those of you, God says, I'm the reason for your life. As you get to know me, you will want to live every day for my glory. Hallelujah. You live a life that's really full. There are those who are saying, I feel the conviction. I know, I know. There are things in my, I have bottles in my house right now. Some of you are saying that I have bottles in my house. They don't belong there. I know they don't belong there, but I'll get to it next week. Maybe next month. Maybe when I get over this depression, I'll get to it. God says, now is the time to get to it. Make a decision. Be bold. Make a decision. Lord, I'm crying out to you. Maybe you say, I don't know how to get rid of it, Lord. 
It has such a hold on my life. But I know one thing. I want to get rid of it. Hallelujah. Have the conviction and make the decision. I want to get rid of it, Lord. Some of you are saying, I have some things, some pictures in my house, some paintings, some books. They have ungodly pictures in them. Ungodly stories full of curse words. And I think it's good literature. It's popular. Even my Christian girlfriends and boyfriends have it. Even my pastor reads it. I want to tell you, you're on the wrong path. The Spirit of God convicts you and says, get that trash out. I can't live with you if you have that there. Make a decision. The Lord, conviction is not enough. I heard it loud and clear. Conviction is not enough. There are people, many people in hell who are heavily convicted, but they never made a decision. Hence, they never followed through and took the action. They're in hell, regretting, I wish, I wish, I wish, when the conviction came, I would have stepped forward, made a decision. God, I want out. I want out from this bondage. You have an opportunity today to say, Lord, I will not live for money. I'm done. Paul the apostle said, speaking by the Spirit of God, he was a man who had it all, but he suffered greatly for the cross of Jesus. He said, I know how to abound. Whether I have or don't have, I'm full of joy. That's the Christian life. A life of victory and real joy. No matter the circumstance, no matter what I have or don't have, I have Jesus. I have everything. Amen. Who can say amen to that? If I have Jesus, I have everything. He is my love. He's my first love. Those of you who can't say that because you're disobedient, disobedient to God. Those of you who haven't cleaned your closets. God wants you to say that. He would, he's waiting for you. to. He loves for you to say that. Truly. But you've got to do what he told you to do. Take out the trash. Say to your loved ones if you're doing something wrong with them. Today marks the day when I stop disobeying God. So help me God. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Are you with me? I'm going to heaven. Are you with me? If you're not, I'm not going to hell. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to follow my Lord and Savior. I love you a lot, but not more than Jesus, my life. Hallelujah. You know what? When you take such a stand, the other person could be convicted so heavily by the Spirit of God, they will say, I'm done too with old life. Let's go forward. I'm going to help you take the trash out today in Jesus' mighty name. I'm no longer living for money. If I have to deny myself, take up my cross and follow my Savior, no matter how cold it is, no matter how hard it is, no matter how painful it is, I am going, I have decided to follow Jesus. Only those people are true followers of God. Did you hear me? Only those people are the true disciples of Jesus. Nobody else. The one who hasn't denied themselves, take up the cross, taking up the cross, and say, Lord, maybe I have two years to live. Maybe I have two months to live. Maybe 20 years, maybe two minutes. Oh my God. Right now, I'm committed to serving you, Lord. That's all I want to know. Because this life has nothing for me. It's a lie. But your life is the real life. Lord, I want to live for you. Lord, would you take me in the 11th hour? God is so gracious. He told the parable at the 11th hour, people came. He said, you're coming to me? You want to sign a contract with me? Step on board. I will pay you what you deserve. And they reap the benefit. Know that the hour is critical. We need to surrender all to Jesus right now. Be convicted. Make the decision. Surrender your heart to God. Take the action. As you pray, God is going to show you more and more. This attitude has got to be crucified today. No more. Don't be furious. Don't be angry. Don't be bitter. Get rid of it. I'm telling you to get rid of it so I'll give you the power. Just like the man with the withered hand. Oh God, I'm so bitter inside. I feel trapped. I'm in a bondage. I can't help but get hatred, feelings of hatred when I just see or think about somebody who's hurt me. God said, because I told you to get rid of it, I will give you the grace to get rid of it. Just do it. 
Confess and say, Lord, I don't want this in my life. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be bitter, Lord. I don't want to carry this regret, Lord. I don't want to be plagued by things I wish I could have done. And the devil's hounding me. See, you're a failure. You're a failure. You're a failure. God says, no, you're not. Because I died for that failure. I'm making you a winner. Hallelujah. I'm making you a victor. I'm making you somebody that can live free from your past. Don't carry your past. I've got a brand new life for you and a brand new future. Oh, Jesus, this is the best message we could hear. God has a future for you. God has life for you now. Take the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Make the decision because God looks at your heart. He looks at my heart. Some people are thinking, you know what? I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't cheat on my income tax. I'm not a violent offender. Those are the people that need God. Go preach to them. God said, you know what? They'll probably enter heaven before you. The prostitutes, the drug addicts, the murderers, the thieves, Jesus said, many of them are entering heaven before you because you think you're better. Oh God, we need to understand we are the worst. Only then can I really receive the Savior because God will show my heart in all the ways that I offended God and kept going on merrily whistling eating and drinking merrily while I hurt God and offended Him and disobeyed Him. When I realized the depths of my sin, I said, Lord, I'm not concerned about the other people. It's about me. I've got to make it to heaven. I've got to have the right relationship with you, Lord. Please, please, Lord, please help me. Help me to get rid of my sins. Jesus, I want to be just like you. Change me, Lord. Change me, change me. We're going to sing this song. As you've heard the word of God, mean it with all your heart. Talk to him even now. He will do something radical in your life even now. Have thine own way, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You, O oh Lord, you're the potter. I'm just clay. Lord, you mold me. I'm surrendering to you. I'm going to yield myself. Mold me, Lord. Change me, Lord. And make me. Here I am yielded, Lord. Right before you, let's sing that to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is doing a real work right now. God is doing something real right now because the message is real. God loves you. God doesn't want you to perish. God wants to use your life as a trophy. He doesn't want you to be complaining and bitter and going in circles in the wilderness for 40 years. He says, come out of it. I have a promised land for you. A promised land for you. Where I'll put you so that the, all the nations of the world will see your life and say, I want your God. I want to go to heaven too. Oh, hallelujah. That's the life to live. Have thine own way. Thank you, Lord. Have thine own way, O oh Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the Potter. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. I am the clay. Everyone in this sanctuary, we should pray and sing this. Mold me and make more like Jesus me. Everybody watching. After thy will, only your will be done in my life. Not my will, your will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Don't put up a fight. Yield to God. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the power. Oh, Father, we surrender to you this moment. Heavenly Father, I am the clay. More work to be done. More work, Lord, in me. Mold me and make me. After thy will, while I am waiting, 
yielded and distilled. I want you to pause right now. Talk to the Lord in your hearts. Don't think about the person next to you. Don't think about anything because on that day, you're going to be face to face with the Alpha and Omega. That's it. Talk to him right now. Everything that you heard. Make a decision. Tell him you're going to follow through on what he shows you. As the music is playing, let's talk to the Lord for a few minutes. Thank you, Jesus. Otherwise, the message, the sermon is useless. You've got to follow the conviction. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Some of you say, I don't want to be fighting anymore. I don't want to be the one to get the last word in. It's an ugly life. I'm supposed to be a Christian, but I'm bickering and fighting. God help me. I don't want to, I wouldn't want to be like this, Lord. I don't want to argue. I want to be a peacemaker, Lord. Oh, Jesus, change me. I've been misrepresenting you, Lord. Change me, Lord. Change me to be a peaceful, gentle person. Thank you, Lord. Some of you are struggling with jealousy. The spirit of de jealousy from the devil comes. And it's, it's bothering you. When you see people prosper, you see their success, you wish you can have that. At the same time, you're not happy that they're succeeding. That's a cancer of the soul. God said, that's not from me. Let it go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Some of you are proud. You like to be heard. You want your presence to be known when you go somewhere. It's a plague of the soul. People have to know that I'm here. They need to hear me, see me. God says, that's not from me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. We need to pray, Lord, hide me behind the cross. Oh, Jesus, hide me behind the cross. Oh, Lord, how I've offended you, Lord, grieved your Holy Spirit. Talking about you, but wanting to be seen and heard myself. Jesus, hide me behind the cross. That's all I want to know. All I want to know is the cross. My Lord died for me so I can live. I don't need to be in the forefront. Jesus. Some of you are insecure and it's because of fear, spirit of fear, anxiety. What will people think about me? It's something that is hounding you day and night. Your thoughts are preoccupied by what people react and how they may react and what they may say. Scenarios playing through your mind, even for a simple doctor's visit. What will that person think? What will my neighbor think? What will my friend think, my relative? These are the possible scenarios, waste of time and energy. Satan has you preoccupied with what if scenarios taking and draining away the life of faith and joy. Enjoying the moment God gives you. You need to confess that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm sorry for not believing you, not trusting you, Lord. I'm sorry for not having my security in you, Lord. You are my security. You're the anchor of my soul. I have no one else but you, Lord. You're my everything. God will meet you if you believe and you ask him. Thank you, Lord. A few more moments. Pray to the Lord. Whatever you've heard, whatever God's telling you now. Make the decision. Tell the Lord, Lord, I mean it right now. And I'm going to follow through. So help me, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's a perfection God gives his people. It's a perfection that keeps getting more perfect unto the perfect day. Growing in the likeness of the Lord Jesus, we can never exhaust that privilege and promise of God to become more and more refined in the perfect image of Jesus. Where the love of Jesus just comes right through your face, through your actions to people, even strangers. Where the holiness of God grips people's hearts who work with you. They know their lives are not right before God just by watching your life. 
Oh, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the real Christian life, the offer this morning, Lord, this afternoon, to live an authentic discipleship life, follower of Jesus. Blessed be your name, Father. I thank you, Lord, for ministering your healing. Heavenly Father, your healing, Lord, of the soul, of the heart, of the mind. There's got to be a new day in our lives where we are done with the old life and things that are still lingering. More crucifixion necessary. Who can say that? God, I need more crucifixion in my life. More crucifixion in my life. Lord, I need a total crucifixion of the self. The old life, Lord. I want to live for you, Lord. Jesus, I want to praise you, Lord. I want to live for you, Lord. I want to live a holy, blameless life. Oh, God, I want that. Only if you cry to God will he give you. If you don't, he'll say, oh, you're treating my word casually. You think it's another service? He'll say, then I can't help you. But if you cry out to God from your heart, say, God, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be where you are more than anything else, Lord. Make me holy. Make me more like Jesus. Put to death the old self in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, the, the, Lord, the, the jokes that are, that are not proper before you, I don't want any part of it anymore. I don't want to make those jokes. I don't want to hear those jokes in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm a holy vessel unto God for the king's use. I can't speak like I used to anymore. I can't give my ears that have been sanctified to things that are not holy because I've, I've, I've been born again. I'm from above. God has called me and shown me who I am. Lord, I don't want to use this tongue for things that don't please you anymore, oh God. Oh, with every fiber of my being, I want to serve you, Jesus. I want to serve you, Jesus. I want to serve you, Jesus. I want to serve you, Lord, with all my life that's left. I may have wasted many, many years, but no longer, no more, no more, no more. No more. I'm making the decision from this point on forward. I'm serving Jesus and that's it. What he says, subtract from my life, I'm subtracting it. So help me God. What he says, add to my life, I'm adding it. That's all. That's all I know. All I know is Jesus and him crucified. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Lord. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Hallelujah. He has cleansed us. He has sanctified us. Thank you, Lord. Righteous is the Lord. Blessed be the name of the one who has dominion from everlasting to everlasting. That's your father. That's my father. We are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. A kingdom that will never end. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, you've humbled us, Lord. We're living for you, Lord. We want to live for you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to sing, Change My Heart, O God. Change my heart, oh God. Let God work. Don't rush. Don't rush this. Let God work. Talk to him. Cry out to him. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Now change my heart, oh God. Me more like you again change my heart change my heart oh God oh father I'm crying out to you with my people with your people make it ever true say that if you're by your loved one hold a hand and say this if you're by your loved one hold a hand and say Lord I, I want my heart to be changed I'm following Jesus are you with me are you going to heaven with me because that's where I'm going. Let's go. Make the decision. I'm not going to live a Christian life that is full of defeat and failure. That's not the Christian life. I want to live a life of victory. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true, true to you. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Oh, holy is the Lord. All worship due to his name. Change my heart, oh God. 
right now this moment lord make it ever true no more hypocrisy no more lying change my heart oh god may i be like you you are the potter for you are the potter i am the clay that's all i am Oh, master sculptor, you are the pot. Let's sing it again. I am the clay. Mold me. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make me ever true. All I want to please is God. Change my heart, oh God. Want to be like you? May I be like you? You are the potter. Thou art the potter. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. You are the potter. You are the potter. Only you can fashion my life to make it beautiful. I am the clay. Lord, mold me and make me. Yes, this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. I need a radical change. Make it ever true. I want to be what you see is what you get type of person. Change my heart, oh God. Hallelujah, just like Jesus. May I be like you. Yes, you are the potter. I am the clay. Oh, mold me and make me. This is what I pray. You mean it? Sing it. Change my heart, oh God. Oh, I need a change, Lord. Make it ever true, true to you, Lord. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Do the heart surgery, Jesus. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. Till I'm just like you. Till I'm just like you. Let's sing that line again. Change my heart, oh God, hallelujah, make it ever true. Now change my heart, oh God, till I'm just like you, till I'm just like you. Hallelujah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray. Work on our hearts, oh Lord. I pray that you give the willingness to your people to desire more than anything on the face of this earth to be just like Jesus, to know you, to love you, and to serve you. Say this with me, those watching online and here, if you mean it with your heart, only if you mean it, tell the Lord because it's going to symbolize your decision that will help you take action. 
Lord, I want to know you more. Lord, I want to love you more. Oh, Lord, I want to serve you more with everything that's within me. Lord, I want to know you more. Lord, I want to love you more. Lord, I want to serve you more for the rest of my life. What's wasted is gone, but I have a brand new life ahead of me. And I want to know you more, Lord. I want to love you more. I want to serve you more. As we conclude before the benediction, let's sing that song. I want to know you more, love you more, serve you more. Elizabeth, can you lead us in that? Thank you, Jesus. We have the lyrics on it. everything. There's nothing compared to this. Hallelujah. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. Sing it from your heart. The greatest thing in all my life, no matter what I've done, what I've experienced, is no wing you, O oh Lord, the greatest thing in all my life is loving you, oh, loving you, the greatest thing in all my life is loving from my heart to your heart, Lord, loving you. I want to love you more by obeying you. I want to love you more. I want to love you more. Jesus, I want to love you more. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you because the Lord has helped me to know more more through his word love him more I really want to serve him with the rest of my life let's sing this hallelujah the greatest thing in all my life is serving you serving you the greatest thing in all my life is serving you I want to serve you serve you more I truly want to serve you Lord more Jesus King Jesus to serve you more with my time, with my talents, with my treasure. I want to serve you with all my heart more. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you one more time father son and holy spirit we serve the greatest thing one god in all my life is serving you serving you yes lord in all my life Serving you with everything I've got. I want to serve you more. I want to serve you more. As of this moment, Lord, the greatest 
everything in all my life and going forward serving you I want to serve you more whatever talents he's given you use it for God serve you more the Lord is bringing you out of your closet hallelujah not for evil but for good serving you Hallelujah. People, come out of the closet for all kinds of things. And they're so bold. They're so brave. They make a statement. They're not scared of anyone. We need to come out of our closet and say, I'm a Christian. Hallelujah. I serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's no turning back. This is who I am. Not just what I believe. This is who I am. I stand for righteousness, holiness, repentance, life, love, true liberty. Hallelujah. We need to come out of the closet and say, not I can, but I can. Through the power of Almighty God, I can, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you need to say that. Those who are watching online and those who are here. I'm going to come out of the closet. I fear no man. I fear no devil. I fear no one. I fear the Lord and only the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you going to college, those of you in the university, those of you in your schools, stand up for the Lord Jesus. Don't let them intimidate you. God reigns. Hallelujah. Jesus rules. He'll rule forever and ever. Who's going to stand up for the Lord? Those of you among your friends who say, come on, do this wrong thing. Do this. Tell them, no, I serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't do that anymore. Hallelujah. When the devil says, if you don't do this, I don't like you. You're not going to have friends. Tell the devil, what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs too. That's the kind of friend I want. Hallelujah. Jesus. What a friend we have to care. Everything. Everything to God. Prayer. Can we raise it a little bit to the next? No. Thank you, Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, oh Jesus, all oh, my sins and griefs to bear. He took it all away with his blood. What a privilege to care to my friend, everything to God in prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. It's not God's will. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Let's in the next have we trials and temptations? This is where the devil gets a lot of people. We don't have to fall. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Just take it to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. 
Take it to the Lord in prayer. I want to stop right here. Friends, friends will drag you to hell if they're not following the Lord. Make no mistake about it. Settle it in your heart. I'm going to have my radar up to see who's really my friend. Those who want me to sin against God, they're not your friends. You need to sever that tie. Either tell them, I'm going to heaven, will you come? God has room for me, he has room for you. Leave that and run to Jesus with me. If they don't, you keep going with Jesus. Because you're responsible for your own souls. Hallelujah. A real friend, a true friend, is one who'll say, let's go to Jesus. And the truest friend is the Lord Jesus Christ. The one not only who will give me an ear when I unload my burdens, share my inmost secrets with no shame, because he'll take away the shame, but the one who could change my circumstances. Oh, thank you, Lord. Never say you're lonely anymore. Never say you're lonely, because Jesus is your friend. He's with you through every trial, every obstacle. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Father, I thank you, Lord, for leading us, Lord, leading us in this service to a genuine repentance so we can follow you, we can shine for you, Lord, exalt you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord a few minutes before we have the benediction. Thank you for what you did, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing, what you're about to do. Thank you, Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are the victor, Lord. We are your children, Father. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. There's not a problem. There's not a trial. There's not a feeling, Lord, that you cannot solve. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for showing us clearly through the story of Jonah, this historical event, Lord, that the people of Nineveh just did what you said. And they lived. All we have to do with all the grace we have through Jesus now, just do what you say and we'll live. Not only live, but have life to the full, an abundant life, free from fear, free from worry, free from every bondage. Hallelujah. What price can we pay for such a life? It's priceless, but it costs you everything, oh Lord. And I receive it freely, Lord. How can I toy with sin anymore when you paid with your blood to set me free from sin? I will live for you, Lord, and I will die for you if need be. So help me, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. What a Savior. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and until we see Jesus face to face. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Praise be to God. God bless everyone. God keep you in the heart of this message. Help you to follow through. Whatever you said in prayer in God's presence, those of you watching online too, take action. God will seal that work, give you great joy, great freedom, and help you to be a mighty witness in your family, in your friend circle, among your coworkers, in your schools, in the government, to this whole world. To God's kingdom comes without end. Praise God. God bless you all. Have a, a blessed Lord's Day. God bless you. And those watching online, God uh, keep you, strengthen you until we meet again next time. Praise God.